Welcome to Out There, where we explore Polk County's hidden gems. I'm your host, Jeremy Moretti, and this month, we're out at Circle B Bar Reserve. Tabitha Beal inside the Discovery Center at Circle B Bar Reserve and uh, if you haven't been here before it's an incredible place just to, to get a great education and foundation um, for what we're going to get into today which is the gopher tortoise uh, one of the cool little species out here that you know I love seeing um, and tell us a little bit about their background um, and uh, why are they are so critical now in the, the studies that we're doing here. So the gopher tortoise is one of those really important species for the upland systems. Um, they're also often referred to as the landlord of the uplands because a gopher tortoise home is actually a burrow down in the ground. They create these burrows which create homes for over 365 different species. So without them there would be a whole slew of other species that would end up becoming endangered if the gopher tortoises were lost. Okay. Now, uh, in Describe to us a little bit for the, the folks that haven't been out here. We've, uh, we've got a variety of different habitats out here. Where is this for uh, Circle B? Yeah, most people identify Circle B with alligators and the birds and even the eagles. And that's a huge part of the site is the marsh system that we have, the Banana Creek marsh system. But the other part that they don't realize is we, Circle B actually lays on the fingertip of the Lakeland Ridge, which is one of the Central Florida ridges. And so we do have some of these upland sugar sand soils that can go up to 24 feet deep on the back side of the property that are actually undergoing restoration. Okay. Now you talk about the, uh, the, the ridge system. Get into a little bit more detail for us and the, the folks that aren't you know, from uh, around here and have that scientific mind. Uh, what is the, the ridge system here? So the ridge system, um, the most well known is, and it's known internationally, worldwide, is the Lake Wells Ridge. It is the largest and the oldest of the Central Florida ridges. It extends from Lake County all the way down into Highlands County. And the reason it's internationally known is because the number of endemic species or species that occur there and nowhere else in the world, and a lot of people don't realize that in our back side of our county on the east side of the county we have plants and animal species that occur nowhere else in the world and so there's this whole suite of species that live in what we call scrub sand hill scrubby flatwoods habitat that are very rare and um, threaten to become endangered okay and so um, our gopher tortoise uh, is uh, in that realm as well and uh, we're now housing them uh, here at circle b now uh, were they naturally occurring here before we started the, the program? So the gopher tortoises have a decent range. So they extend into those upland systems and even into music a little bit. And so at one time they covered a large portion of the state. But again, they were tied to upland habitats because of their burrow. They need the water table to be low enough for them to dig their burrow. And so the other thing that comes along with those high areas is that's the best place for us to develop to for our economy and stuff and our houses, those kind of things. So. With the decline of their habitat, the species started to crash. And then, therefore, we started looking at some places that um, may need reintroduced um, gopher tortoises, like here at Circle B. Um, they would have historically been here on site, um, but once we took over, there were no gopher tortoises left here on the site. Was that largely due to the development that was going on in Lakeland and nearby at the time that just kind of drove them out? How, how did that happen? So it's hard to exactly say why there was no gopher tortoises here. And, um, obviously, the pressure from and development and fragmentation is what we call it, is the cutting off of natural wildlife quarters between populations. Um, that increases the risk for localized populations that may get diseases into them for the whole population to die out. So there could be development, it could have been the fragmentation from development and the diseases, so we're not exactly sure of the reason, but yes. Okay. Now, over the years, um, the, the laws protecting them have changed. Could you get into a little bit of that? For, for some people that might watch government and know how things work when development comes through, I know that's changed. Yeah. So. Um, 
couple of years ago, it's been more than a couple of years ago, but a while back, the regulations were the practice was to, if someone needed to develop their land um, for whatever reason, um, they were able to come to the state and do what's called a take permit. And unfortunately, what that meant is they would write a check to the state and they would be able to take the number of gopher tortoises that were on that site. And that was the practice also known as entombment. And so they would be able to develop the site, basically clear the land and possibly entomb any gopher tortoises that might have been in the landscape. That practice was not favorable to not only the general public, but actually it was the developers that came to the state and said, look, we've got to come up with a better process than doing this to the tortoises. So let's work together. And so there was the formation of a statewide group called the Gopher Tortoise Technical Advisory Group made up of constituents from all over the state of Florida in different areas, local government, federal government, private landowners, consultants, to really reach everybody's needs. And they sat down and made a management plan for gopher tortoises. And now, um, and they came up with the current permitting system, which is actually the tortoises have to be relocated off site. Um, and they're able to be taken to conservation areas um, and added to those areas instead. Okay. So Circle B now is one of those areas. Close. Um, so with that, uh, we do not take what we call construction tortoises, um, those kind of things. We were actually permitted as what is known as a WAIF site. So it's W-A-I-F. Um, through that process of creating a new management plan, it was discovered we had this other group of tortoises that end up at rehab facilities or people have them as pets illegally and they come to the possession of the state that we had nowhere to put these tortoises because you cannot introduce tortoises into um, stable populations singularly like this. And so the state created the program known as the WAIF program. And we were um, one of the first in the state, we weren't the first one, but we were one of the first in the state um, to join in the WAIF program. So we can take in basically orphaned or abandoned gopher tortoises and add them to our um, recipient site here. Okay, so now is it individuals that will call you up or organizations uh, that have taken them in from other people. How, how does that work? How do they come here? So that's one of the most important things, the hardest thing for people to realize is since we are a wave site, we cannot take in tortoises directly. All of our tortoises are brought in through the state, through Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I am not allowed to accept any tortoises until the state approves whether that tortoise needs to go to a wave tortoise or to a different situation. Um, so every time we take a tortoise, it comes straight from the state. Okay, so nobody bring tortoises Nobody here. bring we tortoises all. here. Um, in <laughs> fact, what I want to say about that is one of the th biggest things that people don't realize is that you should always leave a tortoise where you found it. That is the safest option for that tortoise. Tortoises are fairly resilient if they're left to go, and they will move out of harm's way if they need to move because there's dangers of construction our development coming in, they may move back into more vegetated area, more natural area. So they have these natural tendencies to be able to move distances. Once you remove a tortoise from the site, you um, can't relocate it and don't bring it here because there's potential of introducing disease to our population. And that could end up killing all of our tortoises. It could just take one tortoise and it could kill our entire population. Now, okay, so I know I travel a lot of back roads, you know, to and from work. And on occasion, you see the turtle or the gopher tortoise just doing their best to get across the road. And there's some really well-meaning people that will pull off and try and help them. What are good ways to help them? Because I know there's ways that really it's just going to ruin their day. So the first easiest way is it's be safe. Make sure human safety comes first when you're pulling off the side of the road. The second thing is whatever the direction the turtle or tortoise is traveling, just take them to the other side of the road. Um, they may be moving for breeding purposes. They may be, there's a slew of reasons they may be moving. And if they're going that way, as soon as you take them back the way they just come from, they're gonna turn around and keep trying to cross the road. So you're not helping them. You just them. set them back like a half a day. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So take them to the other side of the road. And the other one we always tell people is don't move them far away. Um, these tortoises have social interactions with like family units or pods and territories and those kind of things. So you don't want to take them far away. You just really want to take them to the other side of the road and let them be. Um, finally, tortoises are land animals. Now, they will go in water, going, yep. but do not take tortoises to your local lake and throw them in the lake. That's not, uh, that's not where the tortoise wants to be and not a good situation for them. Okay, so now um, we bring them in here for the, the wave site and 
<clears throat> what's the process that you go through uh, to acclimate them to make sure that they're free of disease or is that already done ahead of time? So that's the interesting thing about the WAVE program is that um, our WAVEs have come from all over the state. We have tortoises in our WAVE program from Tallahassee to Miami, from Sarasota to Vero. So they've come from all corners, all edges of the state. They come from all situations. Some come from veterinarians, some come from rehab centers, some come from law enforcement where they have had to um, take possession of the tortoise for one reason or another. And so the backgrounds of the tortoises that come in are quite varied. Um, so what we have tried to do here on site is to set up a standard process to protect our site population here. And so we hold all of our tortoises for about 24 to 48, 48 hours to look for any signs of upper respiratory tract disease, which is also known as URTD, um, before we release them into the main population and up in the recipient site. Okay. And uh, I know uh, there's a number of cameras out there uh, to, to monitor kind of what's going on. What are the things you, are you guys looking for with that? So we realized a couple of years ago, um, we were attending another gopher tortoise conference with professionals and um, PhD students and professors from the um, state of Florida. And one of the research projects was looking at the social structure, as we mentioned, of gopher tortoises. And we realized we had this unique ability in this confined population, our wave site here, to look at how social structures are set up. And so it seems silly and it's just a curious question that we had volunteers that were wanting to know is, uh, do all the Tallahassee tortoises get together in their little like Northern Florida group and go hang out in one clicks, part? Right? Yeah, yeah, get in their clicks. Or do South Florida tortoises go to a certain spot? <laughs> Um, so we're still looking through that and so we've gotten a research permit on top of our WAFE permit to be able to conduct research on our tortoises and how they're interacting with one another. Um, we haven't quite got to the bottom or any real answers with that information but we have some interesting data that we've collected on how many females versus males and what time of year the WAFE tortoises come in and those kind of things that we're looking at right now. Okay. Anything that any just interesting observations that you've seen in looking through some of the footage, folks hanging out or, you know, even other animals coming into it? Yeah, the camera footage has shown us a lot. We've got thousands and thousands of hours, I think, at this point on camera. And we've got lots of great interactions between um, tortoises, um, whether it's territorial disputes with head knobbing, even a little bit of battle where the males will actually try to push each other over and knock each other over. Um, we also have a lot of mating or courtship um, behavior between a particular female and the uplands. We have, uh, for a long time, we only had three females amongst about 40 males in the uplands. Oh. So, yes, Bless her heart. this female was <laughs> visited quite often. And so it's been interesting watching those interactions with her and how many people visit her on a regular basis and how many different people visit her. Um, we've also, the interesting thing is the what we call commensals, those 365 species I mentioned that visit the gopher tortoise burrow or use them for different reasons. We've seen a lot, everything from grasshoppers to pocket gophers to uh, we've had bobcat, turkey, raccoons, possum, armadillos um, using the gopher tortoise burrows. We've also caught them on camera as well. Well, after hearing all that, I think I want to go on out and uh, I think Steve's ready to, to take us on out to, to see all the gopher tortoises. Sounds good. You guys have a good time. We're out here at Circle B Bar Reserve uh, with Steve King, one of our uh, wonderful volunteers out here that helps us keep track of the different gopher tortoises and uh, the studies that they do and monitoring all their different actions and uh, those types of things. And looks like you got a little bit of a divining rod here on your shoulder. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, how you guys uh, keep track of all this and what all does it, does it mean um, in, in what you're looking for. Right now, the way we keep track of it is um, we have uh, the antenna, this is a receiver. We have five gopher tortoises out here that have um, transmitters that we've placed on their carapace or the back of the gopher tortoise shell. So this allows us to locate them, see what kind of movements they've got. Uh, if they're digging a burrow or if they're changing burrows, this sort of helps us to track them down. Okay. Now, how far can these little guys go? Um, they can go a pretty good distance. Usually once they get established, they don't travel that far. They only travel within a um, 
quarter mile, half mile, something like that wow. normally. Okay. Um, they're wild animals, so you don't know what they're going to do. But we've got a couple that have trekked pretty far around here already. So Yeah, no, I mean, we've got this over here, a whole bunch more back over there of the different colonies. Is that the, the right term to, to call them? Well, they're pods, pods, and okay. we have we have around, I don't know exactly how many now, but we have around 40 gopher tortoises out here now. Um, but we have 120 plus acres out here. Uh, the state allows us to keep two gopher tortoises per acre. Okay. Um, this is a wave site. We're not a relocation site. Mm -hmm. um, and what a wave site is, is these are tortoises that FWC has confiscated or um, people have turned into FWC. They don't know where they came from exactly, so they can't put them back where their original homes were, so they come to us. Okay. Um, we've got permits for that. Um, we've got permits for educational tortoises. We do not have a relocation or a mitigation um, permit. Okay, so now the, the ones that come out here, uh, are they coming from all around the state or are these mostly oh, yeah. local or how does that yeah, work? These, these we just, uh, last week we got in three that came from Tallahassee and one that came from Tampa. We've gotten them from down in uh, Lee County, mm -hmm. uh, down around Fort Lauderdale. Um, so a lot of them are injured and are, have gone through rehabilitation um, and veterinary work. So we just bring them out here and try to give them a new home. Okay, so now how, how much of a range do you have here on your antenna? Actually pretty good, it's about maybe a quarter mile okay. um, right now, um, which is good. These transmitters will last a year or two, okay. um, and then they go bad. We've had a lot more out here with uh, transmitters on them, but they've either fallen off or just died. Okay. Um, not the tortoise, but the, yeah. the transmitter. <laughs> well, now, I, uh, the, the tortoises from uh, what I remember and what you guys have taught me over the years, uh, they can dig down pretty deep. What about like 20, 30 feet, somewhere in there? Out here, you're not gonna see that too much. Maybe up north, okay. um, you will. What they typically do here is they'll dig down to about a foot, six inches to a foot above the water line. Okay. Um, that helps with the humidity, helps regulate the temperature um, in the burrow. And they have a, their burrows typically go down, they'll drop down a foot for every three feet they go out. Um, but out here, I, I don't know, in some of the higher spots, they may be down 10 feet, maybe. And that can still pick up. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, well, you got one here that we're gonna go and look at? Yes, sir. All this right. is one we got in the other day. Um, its frequency number is 162. So we've got it dialed in, we'll turn it on, adjust the gain. And I don't know, can you hear the, hear the beep? Yep, hear that? Okay. And right. then this is just a directional, so it shows us where it is. Sounds good. Right. Well, let's we go, go look for them. Okay. The closer you get, you can turn down your gain, and it's still, it just, when you turn it down, you get a better idea of what direction you're going in. Okay. And there's the burrow right there, so. Now, like this guy, did he just dig this now, or? This is a female. Okay. And she's been here since last week. We initially put her uh, further south mm -hmm. by a camera, and um, she decided she wanted to, we started to burrow for her over there, and she decided she wanted to make her own, which they will do a lot. Okay. We just try to help them. And then what I do is I try to get a, um, a visual just to make sure they are here. Uh, lately, I've been catching them. Um, pretty much in their burrows. We do mark them with numbers. We have cameras set up out here, and that just helps us to identify them on the cameras, mm -hmm. um, to see who is visiting who, or um, who's mating with who. Okay. Um, so, well, that gets so, a little personal, doesn't it? Yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> very. But uh, it's been a fairly active season. It also, the cameras also allow us to um, see what other 
animals are using the birds. So now when the fires come through, whether natural or prescribed or whatever, how long does it take for it to bounce back? <laughs> it's a couple of days it starts growing back. No yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I think it was May that that was burned over there. And look yeah. at it now. Wow. Okay. A lot of these plants out here depend on fire um, to uh, help them grow and propagate. She was up close a while ago. Oh, she's right here. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. This is Isis. Um, and the reason she, we call her Isis mm -hmm. is she has a condition it's called pyramiding on her carapace or the back of her uh, shell. Mm -hmm. um, it has deep grooves like that. Okay. Um, I don't really know her history thoroughly, but chances are she was a pet of somebody's. And usually what happens is they're not fed right, they don't eat natural foods and stuff, so their carapace doesn't form as well. You know, looking at, you know, all this stuff is fascinating and, you know, really just as you're hiking, you wouldn't necessarily know all of these things to look for. Um, if someone's coming out here, what, what are some of the ways that they can, you know, learn about uh, all the stuff that's going on with, you know, you might see a camera here or there, but, you know, really there's no description or anything like that. How can they come out and learn about it? Well, we have a volunteer, Pam Deneve, and she does a um, gopher tortoise talk and tour. Um, it's very interesting. She does um, a PowerPoint before they come out and then she brings them up and will point out, you know, some of the various, the cameras. And can't see a lot of the um, burrows from the tram um, because of the height of the grass and stuff like that. But uh, she goes over a lot of the rules and regulations uh, associated with gopher tortoises. Okay. Um, and she explains about the WAIF program and um, the water levels and how important and why they're a keystone species. So um, she does a wonderful job. Sounds and good. Uh, yeah, well, yeah I think she's we'll great. Have to come back out and check she, that oh, out. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much You're for taking welcome. us around out here. You're very welcome. We're going to tell you all about gopher tortoises today and why they're important. Um, so as far as identification, um, they have that domed shell. They're not like a box turtle that has a hinge. Um, I mean, or other turtles that have a hinge that close up all the way. So their legs and their uh, head don't retract all the way back in so that they're protected from predators. Um, they have those stumpy little feet. They are long-lived. Some tortoises, especially in captivity, can live to be 80. So, but out in the wild, you know, if you're not taken as a, from, uh, when you're young as from a predator, then you likely will live to be like 60. So just think about as long as people live. So the average adult size is nine to 11. We have some tortoises that are much bigger than that. So that's kind of variable. And the uh, only related species in the United States is the Texas tortoise and the desert tortoise, both in, uh, the genus Gopharis, and that means that they burrow or dig underground. Uh, they do spend most of their time in the burrow. Um, when they're out of their burrow, it's usually for like 30, 40 minutes just basking in the sun to warm up. They are cold-blooded. They are reptiles, so they have to warm up for them to be able to digest their food um, and just to get moving. And then they will forage, walk around and forage for like another 30, 40 minutes. So in total, they might spend an hour and a half outside of the burrow during the day, and then the rest of the time they are in the burrow. So this is my uplands we talked about. So these are where my gopher tortoises are. Notice you don't see them. And for you folks that weren't there at the lecture, I'm sorry, but they are only out of the burrows like an hour and a half a day, maybe. Here at Circle B, we have, we have a waif, um, program going on with their gopher tortoise. If you think about the word waif, it basically means orphan. So all of these tortoises are um, from other places that FWC has brought to us. We are not a relocation site, so it's not like a developer said, 
I want to develop this 50 acres over here. We need to move these tortoises. That is not our purpose. We are not a relocation site. We're strictly rafe. So these are your people that get caught with tortoises. Okay, or if you're somebody's moving across the road and they're worried, oh my God, what's going to happen to it? And so they call it FWC and they don't know where the tortoise came from. So then we have to put it somewhere. So those are the tortoises that we get. Some of them are very sad stories. Some of them have severe injuries from being attacked by dogs. And the poor things have, you know, they have now have all their problems. But um, they, tortoises are pretty resilient. So a lot of them do still make it, thankfully. And so this is where we get them so, and put them up here. So when we receive them, we have to do a health assessment. And so we take all the biometrics. We weigh them. We measure them. We notch them. We have a separate permit to notch their little carapace. FWC requires us to notch them and number them, well, to notch them, so we'll know how many we have coming in. And then we also paint the number that we notch onto the tortoise. This is not for tortoise races, so 51 is going to beat number 30. That is not why we're doing it. We're doing it so that on our game cameras, so we'll know number 51 is a male, and he's hanging out with number 20, which is a female. Okay, that kind of thing. So we can see who is hanging out with whom and just studying their behavior because there's not a lot known about their social behavior. If you spend 99.9% .9 of the time underground, there's not a lot known about your behavior. They can get to this big. Yeah. Now we have some out here that are babies that are like one to two inches. We have some that are like the size of my hand. Um, if you didn't see Polly earlier, I could show you Polly when we get back. She's our education tortoise. Um, so we have all different sizes and shapes, and we're trying to get more females out here because we have mainly males, and um, we're doing research. But anyhow, so we have our game cameras, we're checking their movements, we're checking their social interactions, and uh, all the other animals that come to the burrows. So just in a short amount of time, I've been looking at the 5 million camera cards and 5 million pictures. We have 37 cameras, and then if you have 10,000 pictures on each little <laughs> It's a lot of work. So you've got coyotes, bobcats, other turtles, hawks, the turkeys, uh, lizards, grasshoppers, all kinds of animals that we have on film that are visiting the burrows. Raccoons, a lot. Of course, they predate the, the eggs and the babies. Um, any questions about that stuff so far? How do you notch the... the, the uh... They, you can do it two ways. You have a little file, you can do it. That takes forever, and the tortoises do not sit still. And where you have to notch them is like almost right behind their legs, so they're constantly wiggling, and so it's very difficult. But if you use a Dremel, <laughs> it only takes a second. Yes. So, yeah, so Steve, Steve's sitting back there with the beard. He, he does that a lot. And uh, he and I track and do a lot of the research here for the go for tortoises. The right on the top. We paint it on each for the sides. Oh. Yeah, it's what, like with a waxy marker, if you will. It's not truly paint, oh, right. you know. And you have to have a separate permit for that. Yep. You have permits for education. You have permits for keeping. You have uh, permits for scientific purposes. You have all your different permits. You can't do anything with a gopher tortoise without a permit. Thanks for joining us this month for Out There and learning about the gopher tortoise habitats and all that the county is doing to help preserve this uh, wonderful species. Join us again next month when we're out there. Mm -hmm.